Now a page replacement algorithm that actually works is the one we present here, the so-called second chance or clock algorithm. So this approach uses reference bits. So a reference bit is a bit in the page descriptor and this bit is set automatically by the hardware whenever this page that is described by the descriptor is accessed. Now this is much easier to implement than having to keep clocks or counters for each page and it also uses a fewer memory accesses in addition to accessing the page itself. Uh, modern processors and their MMUs support reference bits, though they might be called differently, like for example an access bit on x86 processors. And the objective of implementing second chance is to approach the efficiency of LIU. Uh, so what we do when we use this uh, second chance algorithm is that we set the reference bit of any newly paged in page uh, to 1 initially. And now we don't have an all or nothing decision, but we go over the list of our pages and when we need to page out a page because we have a request for a page which would not fit in memory because all our pages are full, then we are checking the reference bits in order. But now if we find a page which has a reference bit set to 1, we don't replace it immediately because it's an indication that it was recently used, so maybe uh, well, uh, it makes sense to keep it in memory for quite a bit more uh, longer. So we only set its reference bit to zero, so it gets a second chance before we kick it out. And only if we find a page where the reference bit is zero, we replace the page. So uh, you would, might wonder, like, uh, well, what's the difference? Uh, we just look at each page twice. Now, of course, it takes some time to go through all the list of our pages here. So we go through them in order. And uh, if in between the setting to zero here, the first time we go around, and the next checking when we access this page again, the page is accessed again, then this reference bit has been reset by the hardware to one. So this is the indication that it actually made sense to keep it in memory because we had an access soon thereafter. So uh, this is a graphical visualization of second chance. So you can imagine your pages uh, being set up in a linked list, or here we just put them on a circle one after the other in order, and here you see why it's also called a clock algorithm, because now we have a pointer or a hand of a clock just going around our circle and checking the state of the current page. So whenever we need a page replacement, uh, what our algorithm does is it checks the reference bit of the current page, and if this reference bit is set to 1, as we said, it just resets it to 0, and then ticks on to our next page here in our list. So we still need a free page, we haven't found one. So this one also has its reference bit set to one. So we also set this to zero, we tick on, and then we find page E here. Now page E has its reference bit to zero already. So we can replace this page because it hasn't been accessed for quite some time. We replace this page and tick on. So for our next page replacement that is required, we would check page F then. Uh, so what happens if all reference bits are 1 in this circle? Well, then this second chance algorithm degenerates to a FIFO because we have to go through all of the list first, setting all of the reference bits to 0, and then we arrive at the topmost one, which, if it still has its 0, is used, and then the next one, and so on, and so forth. So here's an example for our second chance algorithm, again with our well-known access sequence from our previous examples. Again, we have a small main memory with three page frames, and so uh, we start with an originally empty memory with zero reference bits because we don't have any pages stored in the page frames. So first we have a request for page number one, and we find it here. So this was originally a zero, so we set this to one, we load page number one into page frame number one, and we advance our pointer here to this position indicated in red. So we can also see the position down here. And then we have a request for page number two. Well, our pointer was here. It found a zero, so it loads page number two, sets this reference bit to one, and it wants us one more. Then we need to also load page number three. We're at frame number three with our pointer here. So we found a zero, we set this to one again. So now we have all reference bits set to one, this situation where we degenerate into a FIFO. So when we have our next request, we need to go through all of the list, setting the bits to zero here again. We didn't show these steps because that would make the table quite a bit big. So we set them all to zero, so we degenerate. 
And then we end up, up, up here again, where we have replaced this bit by a zero before. So here we have a request for page number four. So we replace this page, which had its zero set because we went through our circle once here, set it to once, load page four. Then if there's a request for page one again, well, we just kick page one out of memory. So we need to find a new place. So this bit is zero, we go through that one again. We want to load page two. We just kicked out page two, oh my. So we need to load it into the next free frame, which is here. So we load it into here. Now we have this situation again, where all of our reference bits are set to one. So we go through all of these and set them to, uh, to zero. And so when we can load page five here in the next step, then we set this one reference bit to one again. Uh, then we have a request for page number one here. Now, page number one is already in memory because we loaded it up here and nothing was replaced in page frame two uh, since then. So the only thing we do now when we have a request for page number one, we set its reference bit to one. So that's done by the hardware automatically. So we have a change here. So we have our pointer still at this position here, but the bit, the reference bit at this point position was changed by the hardware from zero to one. Uh, now uh, we have a, a request for page number two uh, next. This is also still in memory. So we update this reference bit down here. So again, we have a situation where all the reference bits are set to one. And now we have a request for page number three. We need to find a victim page again. So we need to go all through all of these again. So we set them to zero, zero, zero. And then we arrive at that zero again, replace this by page number three and set its reference bit. And then we have page number four, so we can go through this again. And when we finally access page number five, we find out, okay, that's already in memory. So we just set its reference bit to one once more. So overall, with uh, our access sequence here and three page frames in main memory, we had nine page ends. So uh, what's the situation when we increase our main memory? Because that was what we did for our previous examples here. So let's increase it to four frames again. And we see uh, now if we go through the example again, I won't go through all the details. You can do it as an exercise. We have 10 page ends overall. So essentially uh, this increasing of the memory uh, means we actually increase the number of page ends with a second chance algorithm. So we've seen that uh, also our second chance algorithm, when all of our reference bits are set to one in one uh, iteration through our circle can show this five anomaly. And uh, in the common case, however, a uh, second chance is very close in uh, efficiency to LIU. You can also try to improve second chance a bit uh, by an extension. Uh, so you can uh, also consider a so-called modification bit or dirty bit. We've seen this before. So now we have three classes of reference and modification bit combinations so tuples here. So either we have uh, no modification and no reference, or we have a reference, but no modification. So this page was only read, but not written. Or we have a reference bit and a modification bit set. So this means that our page was referenced and it was definitely also written. So this re reference could be this write access that is noted here in the modification bit, but it could also indicate that we have additional read accesses here. And what we do then with our modified or extended second chance algorithm is we search for the lowest class. So we have the tuples here, we can compare them here and we search for the one which has the lowest combined value here. And this is, for example, an approach used in macOS to do page replacements. Now, maybe it's a good idea not to wait until we run out of memory pages to search for the next victim page, because that exactly is a critical pass in our system. So essentially, whenever we need a free memory page, we first need to yeah, extensively go through all of our pages to find a victim and then do the replacement. So uh, especially with larger main memories, what about just keeping a number of free pages already available that are marked for being replaced? So this free page buffer is a method to accelerate page fault handling. Uh, and what we do here is instead of uh, just replacing pages, we always keep a number of free pages in memory. So essentially we try to evict pages from main memory in advance. We do this page out in advance, but as long as they're not replaced, they can still be kept in memory. 
So uh, this is more efficient because the time required to replace a page now is dominated by the time required for the page in because, uh, well, we have already marked this page as free, even if it might have useful information. So we don't need to find a victim to page it out. And uh, this page to page frame relation, and that's interesting, is still valid after paging out because if we didn't override the related page frame, our information is still in memory. So in case that a page which we consider to be paged out is used again, before it would be replaced, it can still be reused with high efficiency because we only have to enter it into the page table again and into our page uh, management uh, infrastructure here. Uh, so this leads to the page no longer being allocated to the free page buffer and the page is then allocated back again to its respective process. Now when you consider the overall memory availability in your system, uh, then you have to face another problem. So this problem is that your main memory has to be shared among a number of processes. So you have to solve the question how to distribute all of the page frames you have available in uh, your main memory to the processes you have running right now. So you have to answer the question how many page frames should a single process actually use? So should it maybe be allowed to use the maximum number of page frames? So should it just be limited by the number of page frames in your memory? Uh, or should you maybe just allow it initially to have a minimum number of page frames depending on the processor architecture? Uh, so this minimum might be, for example, three pages if you need a data page, a code page and a stack page. Uh, you could also try to have identical share size. So uh, the more processes you have, uh, the less, uh, the lower share of memory each process gets because more processes have to fit in the same size of memory. Or if you have some indication of a program size, for example, by looking at the executables, uh, code and data sections, uh, then uh, you uh, could also try to allocate page frames in main memory to processes according to the size of the executable programs uh, segments here. And for doing this page frame assignment, you could use either a global or a local strategy. So local strategy means that a process only replaces its own pages. So its page fault behavior only depends on its own process execution behavior. Whereas if you consider global page replacement, that means a process could also try to get hold of pages of other processes. So it could ask the operating system to evict pages of other processes from main memory. This is usually more efficient since uh, then the operating system could figure out are there any unused pages of other processes, can we kick them out and allocate them to the process that currently needs more memory. So one effect you can observe when you look at a virtual memory replacement algorithm is that it happens that a page that was paged out is accessed immediately after this page out happened. And if this happens a lot of time, this effect is called thrashing. And thrashing means that the process is actually continuously trying to access a page. It's paged out, so it has to be paged in. Maybe it's paged out again and it's paged in again. So uh, in essence, the process spends more time waiting to handle page faults than it does with executing its own code. And you can observe this when you take a look at the CPU load here on the y-axis in relation to the number of processes running. And if you figure out that you have a high number of processes running, but your CPU load actually goes down, then you have thrashing because your computer is now uh, simply busy with paging in and paging out pages instead of executing code. Uh, so this means even if you have a large number of processes, they just yeah, stand on each other's toes, try to get to other processes' memory. So we're just continuously swapping pages in and out of secondary storage and can't really get our computer to do something. This is not such a big problem with large main memories today, but with early machines with small main memories, thrashing was a real problem when too many users locked in at the same time, for example. So uh, uh, where the, the system was really running low on memory and for example, only had a, a handful of pages available for each of the many running processes. And this means we regularly had page faults, so the system was really busy replacing pages, just doing I.O. instead of doing useful computations. So again, uh, the causes for thrashing are either a process is close to its page minimum, so uh, 
the probability is very high that when it accesses a code or data location that this page is not in memory, so uh, it needs to be reloaded again. Too many processes are in the system at the same time, so you can only give a small share of your main memory to each of the processes. Or you can also uh, have threshing because your uh, replacement strategy for pages is suboptimal. Uh, if you have local page requests, this avoids threshing between processes, but can still have threshing inside of a process. Uh, and you can only avoid threshing inside of a process if you manage to allocate a sufficiently large number of page frames to that process, which in turn would mean you would have to limit the number of processes in your system to ensure that each process has a certain minimum of page frames available for its use at any time. So uh, what can you do to avoid threshing? Now uh, we present two different solutions here and the first solution is we swap processes. So if we know a process is inactive, uh, we know it doesn't really require page frames because it's not running, it cannot access any code or memory locations. So uh, an inactive process's page frame can then be distributed among the other processes. We have one less process in our system, so it can redistribute its memory and the other processes have a bit more headroom uh, for memory allocations for their own memory. Now, this has to be combined with scheduling to avoid starvation, so a process just continuously waiting for getting uh, access but never uh, really uh, getting a chance to do it, and to enable short answer or reaction times. So our traditional uh, three-state scheduling model here of running ready and blocked, as we've seen, is now extended to include a number of additional, chain, uh, additional states. So when a running process here uh, has a page fault because its page uh, was not contained in main memory at the moment, it just gets into a special blocked state, a page blocked state, where it's just waiting for this page to arrive in main memory uh, and then can be ready again. But a ready process could also be deactivated. Uh, so it's in a deactivated ready state or back activated again. And a blocked state can also be uh, a process in a blocked state can also be deactivated and then it's an inactive blocked state here and has to go through all these stages to be activated again. So essentially we have an inactive process here on the right hand side and it has to go through a number of additional activation and deactivation steps in order to be considered for scheduling again. And if this process is inactive, we know it won't be able to execute any code in the near uh, future. So we could actually swap out the whole processes and redistribute its pages among the other processes in our system. Now, the second solution to avoid threshing is to use a so-called working set model. So uh, we only consider the set of pages that are really needed by a process. And this is what we call the working set. As we've already discussed in a previous lecture, there might be some pages belonging to a process that are never really used in a certain uh, yeah, invocation of this program as a process. So for example, if you use a word processor, but you never print anything, all the code pages that uh, realize your print function would never be called. So there's no reason for them to be in memory. The problem is that is dependent on the application usage pattern uh, and maybe on the data that's uh, used by the application. So our working set is not known. It can only be approximated and it's hard to predict. So we do this approximation by looking at the more recently accessed number of pages, which we call Delta here. And uh, we try to do an appropriate selection of Delta. So we have an access sequence here and we try to look at the more recently accessed number of pages here and assume that would be its working set. Now, if this delta is too large, we would have an overlapping of local access patterns, so we would go too far back here. But if it's too small, we know the working set does not really contain all the necessary pages that are really part of the currently used working set. And of course, a working set of a process can change over time if our process changes to a different phase or executes different functionality. Uh, so usually this delta is larger than the size of the working set, since uh, usually we know that a multiple pa uh, the single page is accessed multiple times in a row, not in our example here for our access sequence, but in reality. So uh, we try to keep our delta here, our sequence of pages we consider a bit bigger than that. So when we look at our working set model and our 
success sequence we've seen in previous slides already. Uh, we can look at working sets for different values of delta. So for delta equals to three, we consider three pages here as we've seen. So the first three pages here are inside of our working set and we just look at the access sequence. So when we access page number four, page number one falls out of our working set. So only these three are considered to be main memory. Then we access page number one again. So this one is again set of uh, part, part of our working set and so on and so forth. And if we have a delta of four, we see we can have a larger working set again. So for example, when this fourth access here takes place, we can keep all these pages here in our five page frame main memory. So we don't have to page out pages that often. In this working set model, you can also approximate accesses by time values. So you can uh, assume that a certain time interval is about proportional to the number of memory accesses, but this requires measuring the virtual time of a process. So here you go from just uh, considering excesses and excess sequences to really time distance between excesses. And uh, this means we don't need to keep track only of the absolute time, so your wall clock time that has passed, but we need to know how long a process has been running because the distance between two page accesses can include a larger phase where this process wasn't running at all. So this time distance between these two page accesses would be artificially increased and would wreak havoc with our working set model approximation here. So for measuring the virtual time of the process, we only consider the time in which the process is in state running. So we need to keep this state for each process separately. So we need to keep a separate virtual clock for each of the processes in our system here. So we can uh, first try a very simple approach to do this because we've seen, uh, well, keeping clocks is always a bit expensive, but let's try to do it here. So the naive idea here is to approximate our working set using the reference bit we've seen before an age information per page, so a time interval in which the page was not used. And we need a timer interrupt using a system timer to keep track of time. So the algorithm we would try here is to have a periodic timer interrupt. This periodic timer interrupt is then used to update the age information using the reference bit. So if we found that a reference bit was set, then this page was used. So we set the age to zero because, well, we have just used it. So uh, it was mostly recently used. Otherwise, we increase the age information in a page for all of the pages that were not referenced. And uh, we then ensure that we only consider pages of our current process by only aging the pages that are allocated to our current process. Now, if we have pages with an age larger than our delta, we would no longer consider them to be part of our working set of the process. And these would be victims or candidates for replacement. Now there's a number of problems with this approach. First, this approach is imprecise. So uh, this really depends on the time intervals you choose uh, because you might not catch any intermediate multiple accesses and stuff like this. So what you could do is you could try to reduce the time intervals so have your timer interrupt tick faster, uh, which means you have more overhead, but you can have more precise measurement of the behavior. Uh, but in general, the system is not really sensitive to this sort of imprecision. Uh, but the biggest problem with this approach to work using working sets and timers is that it's actually inefficient because for each process you have to check a large number of pages. You have to update their timestamp information over and over again. And this takes a lot of time just for keeping track of the working set of a process. So the solution you could use in practice here is again a clock style algorithm. We call it WS clock or working set clock algorithm. And this actually works pretty similar to our previous clock algorithm. And this means that a page is only replaced if it's not an element of the working set of its process, or if our process was deactivated, so it's inactive, uh, swapped out, so we can uh, just remove its pages from memory. Now, uh, in the previous uh, working set clock, uh, in the previous clock algorithm, our second chance algorithm, we only set uh, reset the reference bits to zero and then went through it again. Now in this working set clock algorithm, we extend this by also keeping information about the current time of the respective process. So whenever we reset a reference bit, we note the timestamp respective to the local process, so the local process time when this actually has happened. And this time can, for example, be kept and updated in the process control block 
of the respective process. And now when you want to determine the working set of a process, all you have to do is to calculate the difference between the virtual time of the process and the timestamp that was recorded in the page frame when this reference bit was reset. And then you can figure out how old this page is and if this is still pay, uh, part of the working set or not. So for uh, the working set clock algorithm, again, we have a number of page frames here. And we see we have three processes here. So process one kept in process control block, block one uh, is currently assigned uh, page frames E and F. Uh, process number three has C and D. And finally, process number two has uh, G, A and B as its pages. And we have our virtual process time here. So PCB1 has only executed for one unit of time. Process 3 has executed for five units of time. And process 2 finally has executed for six time units. Now, uh, initially, we start at our position here and our timer goes around the circle again. And we see in addition now to our reference bit here, we have a second entry for each of the pages, which is the page frames timestamp. So when we now set our delta to three, so we only consider the last three excesses or time step steps uh, to be part of our working set, we go through our table. So we're looking for a free page. So we have the first reference bit set to one. So we just reset it to zero, but now we also record the processes uh, virtual time here. So this has six time units here. We go to the next one. We again find a reference bit set to one. So we set it to zero and also set that processes time to it. And uh, well, then we find another page which has a reference bit to zero. But since we're at timestamp six here, well, uh, timestamp five for this process here, sorry, uh, then uh, we know that this is actually the difference between five and four is only one, obviously. So this is less than our delta of three. So this page is not replaced. And finally, we go into the next one, so we just leave this unchanged. And then we find another page, page D, with its reference bit set to zero, but its access time is one. So the difference between five and one is obviously four. So this is larger than delta of three. This means that we don't consider D to be part of a working set anymore. So D is our candidate for replacement. We replace this page with, with whatever was requested and move on to the next page in our working set clock algorithm here. So when we apply this working set uh, management here, uh, we have a number of problems. So the first problem obviously is you need to uh, provide more memory for uh, just allocating your pages because the timestamps need memory and it's not always possible to ascribe a page to a specific process. So with this working set clock algorithm you've seen on the previous slide, we've had a fixed assignment of processes to pages. But in many modern situations, you might have shared memory pages as a rule. For example, you might have shared libraries, which are loaded into multiple processes, or you might have shared memory, so shared pages in the data segment of your process. So the first two solutions, well, work, but we can also try a third solution here. And the third solution for avoiding thrashing uh, can uh, be done in an easier way by directly controlling the page frame forward rate. So what we do is we try to measure per process. And if our uh, rate is lower than our limit, we try to reduce the page frame set for a process. And if this rate is above our limit, we enlarge the page frame set. So in addition to talking about thrashing and replacement, we might also consider the loading strategy for pages. So what we've seen at the moment was a load on demand approach. So we only load a page when we actually have a request. So this request for loading a page generates a page fault. Your operating system is invoked. It sees uh, from the state of your processor and MMU that there was a page fault when trying to access a page. So it knows there is one process that demands access to this page. So it can load this on demand. But of course, this in, uh, infers uh, large latency because this process has to wait with uh, continuing its execution until this page was retrieved from secondary storage. And depending on the approach we use, like free pages, keeping a free page buffer or not, then we would also have to find a victim page to kick out of memory before. 
Now the other thing is uh, you could do is to try uh, some predictive prefetching of pages. Now this is probably difficult because pages that are paged out are not used right now, but they can only be used later. Uh, and very often uh, when you have one machine instruction that can lead to multiple page faults. So for example, you can have an instruction page fault because this instruction was not in memory, but this instruction also is a load instruction. So it would load memory from a data page. So such an instruction would cause two page faults during its execution. And the prefetching of these additional page faults here, so this load address, can be uh, can usually not be predicted. We could try to do it uh, by actually looking at the memory page of instructions that was just paged in, and then we try to interpret the machine instruction to figure out is this uh, machine instruction actually additionally accessing memory. So for example, by loading a value or by jumping somewhere, that might be an additional option here, but then we would need to interpret the machine instruction, maybe also look at current register values to figure out if we can do a prefetching before we have an additional page fault. Uh, if we don't do this, well, we'd get a page fault because our instruction was not in memory. So we page in this page with the instruction, uh, which is in the operating system. Then we return to the application to execute this instruction. This instruction accesses a data page that's not in memory. So we immediately switch back to the operating system because we get this additional page fault. And as you can imagine, that takes a lot of time. So we waste a lot of time just switching states between the user mode process, which not even gets to completely execute one instruction. And we're back in the OS handling another page fault. So if the OS, when handling the first page fault, could actually figure out that additional page faults would come from executing that instruction, it could just stay in the page fault handler and immediately load that next required page into memory too. You could do this, but this requires overhead. This is obviously machine dependent, so you would need to be able to interpret your machine instructions. You need, would need to know what's going on, uh, but still an interesting approach. You could also try to load the complete working set in advance when a process is swapped in, but we know uh, that determining this working set precisely is difficult. Uh, and you could also try to detect sequential access patterns. So for example, you would assume that most of your code for an application might be straight line code. So when it has finished executing the last instruction of one memory page, it would continue to execute the first instruction of the next memory page. So you could load a sequence of pages into memory already when you know these sequential access patterns, or you could also try to figure this out for data accesses when you have a linear, uh, uh, well, walk through an array, for example, then you know that this will generate subsequent uh, accesses to memory pages that are next to each other. So what have we learned about virtual memory today? So we know virtual memory is required if we want to enable our processes to use larger logical address spaces than our physical memory allows. So this allows to use uh, large programs, so using large amounts of code and data, even on machines that only have little memory. But we've seen this involves a number of uh, factors which generate overhead. So we have hardware overhead because we need an MMU and we need additional bits in the MMU to, to uh, provide protection here. We need some complex algorithms in the operating system. We can have sort of surprising effects such as this threshing we've seen when all of our processes only have very few page frames left in memory. And uh, this makes our timing behavior unpredictable, uh, which means, especially for real-time systems, this is not an approach you should use because if in a real-time system, you have to guarantee reaction times and well, the code implementing this reaction is currently swapped out, your reaction time increases by uh, some orders of magnitude, which uh, obviously your real-time system would not like. So if you have a simple or special purpose system like a small embedded system, you do not necessarily need these features, and so you should avoid implementing them. But if you have a general purpose server or desktop operating system, virtual memory makes the programmers and the user's life much easier. So that's all we were talking about. Uh, we wanted to discuss about virtual memory here. Uh, so thanks for listening, and until next time.